<laughs> okay, yeah, so my talk will be about object-based image analysis in TensorFlow, and I added a little question, is it contradictory or complementary? Um, the background is um, maybe some words about my, me and myself. Um, my name is Peter Hofmann, and I am a geographer. I studied geography in Munich and finished in 1997, and then later on I made a PhD in Salzburg University in 2005. And from 2000 to 2005, I was working for the company Definience. Maybe for some of you, this say something. Uh, the company who has um, yeah, developed and sold eCognition. Meanwhile, eCognition is owned by Trimble. Uh, and yeah, the development is still continued, but I'm no longer with the company so far. However, Salzburg also has, um, yeah, is an, uh, let's say, a, a knowledge point for object-based image analysis. And um, we did a lot there with Obaya and with eCognition, of course. And uh, meanwhile, all this uh, Obaya hype has a little bit flattened. And um, I would say, um, yeah, with the upcoming of, of uh, CNNs and uh, neural networks and stuff like this, and in general machine learning, um, yeah. So this is uh, more interesting at the moment for the remote sensing community. Nevertheless, I think that Obaya still has its advantages and has a reason to be in the remote sensing community. And uh, as I said, when you when you um, gave your presentation at ITC, I told you I think there are some connection points, and these connection points um, I would like to yeah, point out and demonstrate. And for those of you who have no idea what Obaya means, I give a very very short introduction, and um, also uh, focus a little bit on the things where I think th there could be the connection points. So the next slide, um, it's unfortunately not. Um, animated, <laughs> so they are just some nice pictures. Yeah, so what means object-based uh, image analysis? Well, the main point is that in contrast to, to classic pixel-based image analysis, uh, Obaya is working on so-called image objects. Um, and these image objects are generated by any sort of image segmentation. Uh, you can use whatever you like to do an image segmentation, but this is where everything starts in, uh, in uh, object-based image analysis. And this can be anything, and this can be uh, whatever segmentation algorithms you think is the best uh, suited for you. And usually, I will come to this point later on, usually the initial segmentation is not an optimum segmentation. It's just an image segmentation that produces objects. Um, ideally, of course, every image object is a representative uh, of, of a real-world object of interest for you, which is in the image you want to analyze, of course. And you can see here some examples. So this is a very recent one um, coming from a um, semantic segmentation in the context of uh, autom automotive and autonomous driving. Here are some examples from medicine and from, uh, yeah, from um, biology. And on the right, you can see some remote sensing examples. And ideal means, as like here, you can see the tramway, the cars, every object of interest is an image object itself already and can be addressed as such and can be analyzed and uh, yeah, um, can be um, uh, integrated in the further on uh, analysis process. Or like here, this is typical for medicine. I was also involved in medical image analysis for a couple of years and uh, in, in brain image analysis. <laughs> and uh, this is very typical here to differentiate between the dark and the, and the, and the bright matter of the brain. Um, and I think here you can even see some lesions. I don't know, this is just, I, I just downloaded this from the internet without thinking, it was just for demonstrating. So yeah, so image objects are the, 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 um, the building blocks of Obaya. This is why it's called object-based, of course. And um, so segmentation is a critical point, but um, I think you can create any sort of segments really you would need. Um, another point is, um, why do we actually do this image segmentation? Um, so one thing is image objects or image segments have uh, plenty much more of uh, features you can use for describing an area of, of the image. So a pixel is just squared like, and it has a certain spectral information and the position, and that's it. This is everything you can use with a pixel. With objects, you have suddenly, you have shape, you have a certain texture within this area, you have, you can have, even have um, uh, relationships to neighboring objects, 
you can count them, of course. Um, you can count only uh, certain sorts of segments and so forth. So, um, so image objects or segments, they are in a way much more powerful than simple pixels. And um, yeah, this is actually the reason why, why, why we, we like it. Um, however, on the other side, in the years before Obaya existed, we had satellite images, usually Landsat like, like with a 30 meter resolution. And with this resolution, it was already enough to have just a simple spectral information of each pixel for doing landscape analysis or um, for doing um, land use, land cover classification, stuff like this. That was enough. But with the very high resolution satellite data, it appeared that in a single pixel, there's not very much information um, except the spectral information. So it makes more sense to aggregate these pixels to meaningful objects and then to analyze these objects. This is actually the background. You can see here, this is a, a forestry example, not perfectly segmented, but however, you can use every single segment here uh, to count single trees, for instance. And on the right side, you can see um, what I said with mutual relationships. So this is an artificial image, of course, but also in, in, in real remote sensing images, you can analyze relationships between objects. Like, for instance, if you have a vegetation area with um, forest-like vegetation and some meadows, and which is surrounded by urban areas, then you can make this area to a park. And this way you can you can deal with this uh, with, with other sorts of yeah rather complex semantic complex objects as well. This is also seen as a, a very advantage of object based image analysis actually. So uh, altogether, it's um, it's like a mixture between um, just plain image analysis or plain image processing and also some GIS operations like with you have with polygons that you can do shape analysis and, and, and other geometric operations you like. Um, here are some examples from the different domains. Um, I mean, the reason why we're doing all this is actually we want to analyze the content of the images. Uh, as like in remote sensing, we are first segmenting, then classifying, and then the classified objects should be somehow exported to a GIS system, for instance, or in medical uh, uh, domain to do some, some further medical diagnosis with other software. But this is an example where I was involved with. Um, this is, was about um, uh, multiple sclerosis lesion and their development over time. And this was a, a, 3D, um, a 3D image analysis project where we then made some, some geostatistics in the brain um, to, uh, to track the, the cause of the disease of the patients. And um, here you can see another example, which is uh, actually from paleontology. This is a tooth of very small mammals. Um, the tooth in reality is about two millimeters of height. So this was a micro CT image in 3D with voxels. And the task here was um, to distinguish uh, different parts of the tooth. So they, you have here in blue, the enamel, and then uh, in, in reddish, you have the, the pulp cave. And the geometry and the geometric relationships between these three types of objects is interesting for the paleontologists and also uh, a shape analysis. But this, the paleontologists would not do in, in Obaya software. He would rather do this in some dedicated software where you can do all this analysis, like, I don't know, not cut, but uh, maybe some, some other um, software that allows it to him. So, uh, and this also leads me to the question, why actually is object-based imageless? Um, uh, as I said already, so in the, in the millennium, or in the change of the millennium, um, these very high resolution images came up like Iconos and, and, and further on. And with these high resolution satellite images, you can see on the left side, if you do a standard classification, you get this, what is called the salt and pepper effect. So this is like, if you look at the forest, this, this forest area is not really contiguous and the holes in it are, yeah, not really holes. This is something, I don't know, uh, where, where just the reflection is not, not as it is supposed to for a forestry area. On the right side, you can see these contiguous areas. So if you want to do landscape analysis or uh, land use, land cover classification and stuff like this, you're more interested in these larger contiguous forest areas. The same for urban areas. You have a lot of different small reflections here inside of the urban area. And here you see we have just one, okay, not here in this example, but usually if you merge this object, you have one single urban object as an example. The same with agriculture areas in, in yellow. So um, yeah, so this, is, this answers already the question, why is Obaya? Um, because of this very high resolution data, 
it makes more sense to work on, on uh, segments and objects instead of single pixels. So the pixel itself is more or less meaningless. It just holds the spectral information for a certain position, and that's it. Another aspect is that, um, especially in, in landscape analysis, in geography, and especially the guys in Salzburg, they did this since years, uh, uh, even decades already, they're doing some sort of hierarchical landscape analysis. So you have small scale and large scale objects, and they all are somehow connected, like in the forest, the forest is connected between different trees. So you would never um, address a, a forest by its single trees, you would address it as a forest, but sometimes you're interested what types of trees are in the forest and stuff like this. So you can see this as a sort of a hierarchical dependencies between these different types of objects. And um, not every software, but especially eCognition, I will come to this point later on, supports this hierarchical approach. So you can address these hierarchical interrelationships between larger objects and smaller objects in the same area as like between the forest and the trees, for instance. This is shown here on the right side. You can see here um, larger objects on top and smaller objects on the base segmentation levels, and they are connected, and then you can uh, yeah, define rules um, or other interrelationships between these objects. And the last point I, I would um, uh, address here is uh, a further reason was actually at that time that in uh, with Obaya and especially with the eCognition software, it was possible to use at that time already artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies. Um, artificial intelligence is not only neural networks, it's much more. And for instance, if you think about ontologies and semantic networks, this is also part of, of uh, artificial intelligence. And that was very modern at that time. This is one reason why especially eCognition is very much based on these explicit knowledge descriptions. So if you do a classification with, with eCognition and Obaya software, uh, usually, you more explicitly describing what you want, and this starts from already from the from the pre-processing, like the segmentation algorithms or the classification algorithms, and so far, and also and uh, the, the the class descriptions are more explicit. There are already um, some some implicit um, classification algorithms implemented. Implicit means based on samples, as like neural networks, but also statistic classifiers like support vector machine and stuff like this. And you can use them also in Obaya, um, but the, the 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 basics or the basic ideas were rather um, yeah explicitly describing what do I want, and um, then uh, uh, finally after the classification, uh, assess to what degree does my classification result actually fulfill the criteria I said before, like this, and you can see here on on the on the on the left side this is a typical uh, process tree of eCognition where everything that should happen during the analysis is noted down in a sequence, starting from segmentation or before the NDVI is calculated, then comes segmentation and then classification, stuff like this. Here you can see class hierarchies. There are two types of class hierarchy, um, uh, inheritance. So you can also use inheritance so that you have, for instance, a top vegetation class as like here, which is only defined by the NDVI and it inherits this NDVI criteria to subclasses, which are also vegetation but uh, more specialized, like for instance, in this case, agriculture and other vegetation, or like meadows or whatever you want, forests, stuff like this. And um, yeah, you can describe the classes explicitly and you can use fuzzy logic, that's quite interesting because fuzzy logic allows you to also uh, express an, a certain uncertainty of your classification, um, also in the result, but also in your knowledge. And um, Every, every classification rule based on fuzzy logic should also be based a little bit on the ontology behind of the classes. Ontology means how would you actually describe the classes from your world knowledge, so to say, as like a house is, has four walls, has a roof and stuff like this. It has windows and so far and a certain size and a certain shape and stuff like this. This can all be expressed here in, this, uh, in the fuzzy manner and then brought into uh, classification rules. So in the end, your classification is more like an expert-based, uh, expert system-based expert system -based, um, classification result, which makes it very transparent and understandable for, for other people, especially if you, uh, if you want to interpret the results of the classification. So um, coming to an end about what actually means uh, OBIA is, um, 
uh, in real life, if you work with Obaya, this is it's not like a, a straightforward process. It's rather an iterative process. So usually, this is what it says here. Uh, you start with very rough segmentation and classification algorithms, and then you focus on certain areas, as like here. So you start with a foreground, background, or here in this case, the skull. And then if you, once you have the skull, then you say skull and brain or nervous system and so far. And then in the end, you have something in the brain and maybe even something that is interesting for you. And for every stage, you have some different algorithms that lead you to what you actually want. And the same in the remote sensing community or domain. You have some input data, which are usually remote sensing image data, but you can also have some other data like elevation data or even uh, TS data or metadata. And this you give to, to your uh, initial segmentation, which gives you the first object primitive, so to speak. And these object primitives have properties you can use for an initial classification. And this is usually quite rough. So usually you just uh, distinguish between, if you do it for landscape analysis, uh, simple classes like water bodies, like forests, as we saw in, in the example before. And then you're focusing on, on all those object classes you are interested in, which are not perfectly segmented yet. So you can then start dedicated segmentation algorithms for certain types of objects, which then generates enhanced objects, which have new object properties, which you then can use for another classification. And this process you can do as often as you like for all those classes you are interested in, depending on how detailed your classification result should be. So you can also think about what you see here in this eye-like image is more or less the same thing as you can see here, but only the projection has changed from the X to the Z axis. And everything you're doing here is, is then stored in a so-called rule set. Well, rule set um, is more or less an, uh, like an algorithm. It's like more or less like in a programming language, but much more simpler. And a rule set can be reapplied to any other kind of, of a similar image data. And hopefully, you get the same results. I say consciously, hopefully, because I will come to this point later on. However, once you're finished, then you have your end classification result, which is the final classification result. And then you can export everything you were interested in as like polygons, points, lines, raster, tables, whatever you need for your GIS analysis later on. Uh, or even just do some statistics about dedicated objects like counting counting the houses in a district. So then you, you just get the number of the houses or of certain types of houses or whatever you're interested in. And yeah, in the remote sensing community, I mean, uh, Obaya exists meanwhile since around about 20 years, even longer, I think. And um, yeah, you can imagine that in the remote sensing community, Obaya is uh, applied for many applications. Um, land use, land cover is certainly the most um, yeah, dominant one, but also change detection is coming up much more recently because we have these huge data archives and we are now interested in changes and monitoring and stuff like this. Uh, object detection is always an issue for any kind of image analysis, also in the remote sensing community. Environmental mapping monitoring, of course, uh, but also what I'm currently involved in is damage and disaster mapping, which is strongly connected with change detection, of course. Uh, I did a lot also in all urban and regional planning mapping. So this here is an example for informal settlement mapping, not from my side. Funnily, I got this from an article which used the same colors as, as I did in my thesis and in my papers. Um, hope this guy was citing my, my research. Um, and also agriculture, forestry, whatever you, you can imagine where remote sensing is applied, also Obaya is always applied in. So here we have some examples, uh, like here it's about counting some plants uh, for agriculture. And uh, in the background, I think this is something about urban planning. Yeah. So you can, you name them, all these applications. Um, and as I said already, eCognition is here really uh, dominant software. Um, you can uh, you can create complex rule sets. As I said before, you, there's more or less no limit uh, what you cannot do. And um, these these rule sets are yeah they are written in this uh, so-called cognition network language. Um, it's it's a sort of a domain specific language, as computer scientists would say. It's a graphical language, so you don't need to do any programming as like in Python or something. So you just 
click all your uh, algorithms and processes together and um, parameterize them, and that's it. Um, it's um, yeah, it takes a while until you have learned it, but once you learn it and you understood it, it's quite powerful. Actually, you can more or less do everything with it. We even did some experiments, so we even reprogrammed the game of life. Some might know of you, it's a, like a cellular automata, so we reprogram it in, in cognition network language, just to see if it's if this is possible too. Um, what is of advantage, especially with eCognition, is that it offers even a client-server environment to process very, very large data sets and very large uh, images. Meanwhile, the size of images is not so much a problem, but I can remember uh, in the beginning of the millennium when I got my first QuickBread um, scene, which was on a DVD. So this was really, for me, this was something like, wow, there's one satellite image which is as large as a movie. <laughs> um, and that was really a problem to process such uh, uh, large data sets. Meanwhile, it's, it's, it's less problem problematic. Sorry for that. Sorry for that. Uh, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, sorry. Sorry for that. Um, yeah, so uh, you can work in a, a client-server environment with, with eCognition. Um, if you're interested in that, I would recommend you to take a look on eCognition's website, where everything is about this is uh, much more explained in detail. Um, yeah, and it allows even to design tailored solutions so that you can give it to other people which uh, don't need to have all the background as uh, uh, an, an expert on e-commission should have, uh, so that um, yeah, these people then could easily parameterize um, the rule sets and apply them for themselves. Uh, a, a disadvantage is that it's um, the software itself is not open source, and it's sometimes it's a little bit badly documented. Um, uh, and as far as I know, there's, there are no, not many alternatives available, which you could really call as an alternative to e-cognition. Um, what I know about is uh, InterImage, which is uh, from my colleagues from, from PUC Rio in, in Rio de Janeiro in, in Brazil. Uh, it was developed together with INPE, which is the, the Brazilian NASA, so to say. Um, but it's not as powerful as e-cognition is. And I don't, I'm not aware about any meaningful other alternatives to e-cognition in this Ubaya domain, unfortunately. But um, yeah, maybe one day it will happen, we don't know. So, and um, also, um, although Ubaya is a very mighty, um, uh, mighty way to analyze images, it also has some bottlenecks. And um, one bottleneck is that um, the um, yeah that um, the rule sets you develop they are more or less developed for just one sort of images. So this, this is what I wanted to say here with some if you if you don't have stable stable images stable means in that kind that you de that you have images which are not very much varying um, then everything is fine. As like in medical image analysis or what I said with these tools, or if you have some applications where you can expect that the images will always look like the same, then everything is fine with Obaya because then the rule set will certainly produce you similar results as it uh, does for your original image. But in remote sensing, this is a little bit different. And the example here tells you a little bit. These are Pleiades uh, subsets from uh, Dominica in the Caribbean Sea. Uh, taken around about Hurricane Maria in 2017. So this, uh, the second one is directly after the hurricane taken. And the other one behind is taken before and the two ones uh, were taken after this hurricane. And um, of course the hurricane destroyed a lot. This is why the vegetation looks very different right after the hurricane. But nevertheless, you can also see some other spectral differences between these images. And I can tell you also the co-registration between the images is not the best. And additionally, in this project, um, you can see on the right side, we, were, we are also using some author images taken from, from air photographs, which are just RGB. 
taking the same uh, uh, imaging the same scene, but are um, yeah of course very different in resolution and in, in, in the spectral capabilities as the satellite data. So if you have one rule set which you want to apply to all this data, you will certainly fail. So you always have to a little bit to to adapt the rule sets at least for the Pleiad data. And if you also want to incorporate the RGB images from, from, from the airborne photographs, then you have to add parts really to change your rule set because, for instance, there's no near infrared available and stuff like this. And the resolution is different. So also the segmentation has to change. And um, so this is a little bit what, what hampers the, the Obaya technology or the Obaya idea because the transferability and the robustness of these rule sets is, is still an issue. Um, in my PhD, I, I was uh, researching a little bit how you can measure the robustness of these rule sets. And I realized um, the measuring the robustness is one thing, but creating robust rule sets is another thing. And it's not so easy. Um, and as a rule of thumb, the more complex your, your um, rule set is, the less it is really transferable. And this, the, 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 com the complexity of the rule set, of course, also depends on the analysis task. Uh, detecting water bodies, uh, from from satellite images is relatively easy, but uh, like urban areas, it's or differentiating in urban areas, for instance, is much more complex. And so do the rule sets. And um, as I said, the more complex the rule sets, the less they are really transferable and reapplicable for for other images. Um, I was then involved, or I created actually this research project, which could act as an alternative, or at least as one solution. Um, so the idea in this uh, project was actually, so if, if I always have to adjust the rule sets, um, this is obviously ha hampering the automation of Obaya. So what if these rule sets or parts of the rule sets could adapt themselves according to the changing images? That was the basic idea. And even more, the next step was, what if the objects themselves behave like uh, software agents so that they could uh, adapt themselves according to changing imaging conditions? That was the idea behind. So that uh, every image object then behaves more or less like a robot. So it can can change itself. It can maybe um, um, talk to its neighbors or even um, exchange uh, pixels or, or areas and so far uh, in order to improve themselves. That was the idea. <clears throat> uh, negotiate um, what to do next and so forth. Um, so um, yeah. So this was an attempt. Um, you can imagine that the the um, uh, the the yeah the power um, of of this approach is quite low because um, you need so much uh, computing power that you can really process whole images. Um, it's not really possible. So what I could only demonstrate was in an like in an area as you can see here on the screen um, that I could demonstrate that the, the principle works. Um, but it's not something that is really scalable at the moment for larger images. Um, and yeah, a possible next step in this domain could also be to have learning agents so that uh, agents learn from their previous behavior, what was successful and what was less successful um, for future situations so that they could um, adjust themselves and to optimize themselves. So this was just one approach, but this is still basic research and we don't know what will happen in future, um, how successful this really will be. Um, another point where I think that um, uh, TensorFlow or, or in general CNNs and, and object-based images could somehow connect is, um, of course, uh, as a classifier. Um, there, there is something implemented in eCognition, but this is really funny because um, this CNN uh, only classifies pixels. So it just takes um, sample pixels, which are in, 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 in sample segments, and takes these pixels as input to train this, uh, the CNN and then classifies pixels. So this is actually mm, yeah, a little bit contradicting the, the idea of Obaya and not what you would really expect if, if uh, both worlds are somehow connected. Um, so this, uh, and we have currently, we have an, a, a thesis running, but we don't know yet at the moment what the results will be uh, at ITC, uh, which will exactly do this. <clears throat> uh, 
Another point is um, what I find quite interesting is um, that uh, if you think about CNNs or in general about artificial neural networks, the output is always something like it's it's not a, a strict result. So every neural network uh, usually gives you um, a classification value for each class uh, between zero and one, which means or which expresses more or less the, the certainty of the network that what you have uh, classified that uh, these these objects, pixels or whatever really belong to the class the network thinks it is. So, uh, and this directly translates to a sort of a, a fuzzy classification result, which is more or less the same thing, um, expressing the uncertainty. And um, so in the, in the neural network domain, this is called usually a heat map. So every pixel has a classification result, which is certain or less certain. And the same is, uh, is also uh, if you do uh, fuzzy classifications. So here I see a very strong connection point, quite interesting, because uh, I, I once did also some research on how could you use this uh, fuzzy result actually to more control the whole process. What you can see here on the right side, um, I did some analysis um, about analyzing the classification results, the fuzzy classification results. And um, so for every object, which um, was below a certain um, threshold of certainty, I said, uh, for these objects, please try to reclassify them. And if you cannot assign them to the uh, classes which are on, on, the, on the tree level of your classification tree, then try to assign them to the next higher level. So that's, for instance, if you have objects which are classified as vegetation, and maybe even uh, would like to be something like wooden vegetation or mixed vegetation or something like this, but where it's very uncertain to assign it to one of these classes, but what you at least know is that they belong to vegetation. <clears throat> and so this way you get uh, a classification result, which um, yeah, does, does more or less its best <laughs> in, in terms of classification results. And if it's uh, somehow undecided at this level, then it knows that it can uh, at least assign such objects to the vegetation class at the next higher semantic level. And the same you could do with uh, neural network classifiers because they produce the same result more or less. So this would uh, actually lead you to a sort of a neuro fuzzy control uh, obaya, if you like. Yeah? Quite interesting, I think. <clears throat> Another point is um, what, you, what we can recently uh, observe is uh, everything around segmentation and classification, things like semantic segmentation. This would be very interesting to have something like this as a segmentation algorithm included in Obaya software. Uh, the advantage here would be you get uh, segmentation and classification in one step, which is quite interesting. And because it is done by a neural network, you also get an, an uncertain classification result, which you could use then for further control of the, of the, the next process steps. As I said in, in the beginning, if you do um, Obaya, you, you have these uh, yeah, processing and processing chain uh, usually noted in, in, the, um, in the rule set. Um, yeah, you, can, you could then use this uncertainty or this fuzzy assignments or uncertain assignments to control the next steps, what you would like to do the next so far. And um, a last point where I think, or oh, not, not, not completely last point, um, is uh, where, where I think that uh, artificial neural networks <clears throat> and Obaya could be connected is um, in this uh, transferability <clears throat> area or in this reappli reapplication area that neural networks could learn from, from neural operators how they would adapt the, the rule sets to produce similar results. I noted down here the typical <clears throat> uh, workflow. So in the beginning you have a rule set and you have some image data and you want to get some results. And actually, you want to get similar results for different images, but the images themselves are somehow different. What I said before, <clears throat> so you have some haze in one of the images, the radiometry is not the best and stable. So you always have to do some little adaptations. And this can take a lot of time and can be very labor intensive. So what if, if you have some neural networks which, which more or less observe you in your doing and learn what are typical parameters for typical applications to adjust and even to learn the, the span to, to adapt these parameters, like for instance, for the segmentation, the segmentation parameters, but also maybe the sequence of certain steps. Um, so this could be interesting, actually. It's a little bit like similar to, to the a buyer approach, but rather focusing on the rule set than on the objects themselves. 
Um, now comes to that last point um, where I think there are some connections is also, as I said in the beginning, with Obaya, we are uh, more working with explicit knowledge than with implicit knowledge. Explicit means um, you uh, express yourself, your world knowledge in terms of an ontology, and this ontology yeah, is then represented in all your classification rules. Um, as like as I said, uh, uh, a building or a house has a roof. The roof looks red and is square shaped and stuff like this. So all these rules um, they describe or they are sort of a model of the real world. Uh, but uh, the problem is that these ontologies only describe the ideal objects, and uh, you always have some deviations from the ideal. And the question is, to what degree can these uh, can other objects deviate from these ideals to be still classified? And if you use uh, neural networks to learn this, um, this could be maybe an interesting point so that you have, uh, uh, let's say, your human knowledge about the, the ideal object, how they in general look like, and then you have a neural network which is capable to, to notice how the deviation is and then still assign deviating objects to the true class you are actually interested in. And this could also help a little bit to this um, yeah, often criticized black box behavior of artificial neural networks, because then there would be still the knowledge of the, of the operator about how would you actually describe a building, for instance. But the neural network helps you to adapt uh, to, the, to the current situation. So coming to the summary, um, answering the question, are Obaya and CNN's contradictory or complementary? Well, yes and no somehow. Uh, but as I, as I said, or as I think, is um, that um, uh, a synthesis could help us a lot. And um, I noted down here some pros and cons of both approaches. Um, and, and if you uh, yeah, take the, the cross matrix here, then you could also see a little bit how both could ben benefit from each other. <clears throat> So as like in uh, neural networks always ha uh, have as pro as I see them is they are very, very good in pattern recognition. Uh, even in, in complex situations, <clears throat> they are capable to, to, to recognize objects of interest, uh, which, uh, and, and they are very robust against perturbation, so to say. It means varying image data, especially in the remote sensing domain. All the images I presented, uh, the, the examples I presented here about this varying data, they are relatively stable against this. And yeah, and they, they produce soft classifier results, which is quite interesting because you can use it really for further controlling <clears throat> and also for the interpretation of the results. And um, for the user, the, once they are trained, there's not much to parameterize. You, you, so you take your trained network and you give your input data and then you get a result. And the, there's no question how it does it. Um, usually you get quite good results. And this is also a little bit a, a, con, a con point. Um, as I said, the black box behavior of neural networks is always criticized. And um, yeah, that's how it is. And sometimes even experts told me, oh, we don't know how the network does it, but it does it quite good. And the results are convincing. <laughs> um, yeah, you can take this uh, or you can um, criticize it. Uh, up to you. Um, <clears throat> Another, disappoint, uh, another disadvantage of neural networks is what I just read in a, recently in an article is you need many samples to get a reliably trained network. So in this article, they said, ah, actually, they were thinking about using neural networks. It was actually about uh, uh, detecting destroyed bridges in radar data. And they said, the problem is there are not so many destroyed bridges that they could really uh, train a network. So they used statistical classifiers for that issue. So that's, a, that's a, a point, uh, can become a critical point. So it depends really on your application if you, really, if you can use uh, artificial neural networks and CNNs in particular um, for your task. Um, and this is also a point, they do not really reflect the semantics, as I said before. So you, you, you have a trained network, you give your data in, and then you get results out. Uh, but it's up to you to interpret, interpret the results. And there's no semantics in, in the rules inside of the network. So it's just yeah, connections between neurons, and that's it. Um, on the other side, I mean, this is an advantage of a buyer uh, and all explicit classifiers. This is very explicit made in these classifiers or in these approaches. But it's also a disadvantage because, as I said, 
it makes all these uh, uh, solutions not really transferable um, and reapplicable. So you always have to tune something. Um, but yeah, you understand what's happening. So as a pro is um, in Obaya, the, 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 the feature space you can use for classification is immense. It's more or less endless. Um, and you can even use some semantic information and some, some context information for classification and uh, even temporal information, if you like. Um, and yeah, the knowledge uh, used for the classification is really explicit described there. So, so for you, usually it's not really so complicated to understand the result, why a, a classifier comes to these results. So you can always see, okay, it's because the NDVI is at a certain value and this is the reason why it classified this for vegetation and another object not or so. <clears throat> and at the same time, this also reflects the human understanding of the real world or of the expert who did actually the, 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 the rule set. And it can also produce soft classifier uh, results, as I said. Um, um, the results can also be um, yeah, gradual and um, express some uncertainty in the classification result, which I rather see as an advantage as a disadvantage, because for the same reason, you can use it to control the next steps for the processing. And um, yeah, the cons, I think I, I said already, it's limited in automation because it's yeah, hardly transferable. You always have to adjust and, and, and um, yeah redesign sometimes your rule set um, so it means it's not quite flexible and often needs some some further parameterization yeah so that's it thanks for your attention and i'm open for any questions peter that was so fantastic thank you so much for that really great talk um i will open it up to any questions on the line And I'll hand it over to, to Kabir. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peter. It's really wonderful. And um, I'm fascinated to see that all the object-based CMS analysis you have presented. So um, this, uh, just one quick, uh, not related this presentation, but recently Equination community, they updated their website. After that, whatever materials in their Equination community, everything has lost. So um, I think uh, uh, still you are in a, it's a, like Munich office, you are connected like with them. So why everything has been lost in their recognition community? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> You're not the only one who is asking this question. Um, well, I think one, as I said in the beginning, I think one point is certainly the, sorry for saying, for the hype of the of the neural networks that we're currently experiencing. So everybody who before did a lot of OBIA is now doing a lot of the CNN and classification. And um, yeah, I mean, the results that CNNs are producing are sometimes really, really interesting and very convincing. Uh, the other point is the community uh, is, um, the OBIA community is quite small. And we are all busy, so am I too. I have a lot of ideas what we could do, but I don't have the time to do this, even to, to, to write proposals. I have something in mind, maybe there's something new coming up in the next months, I don't know. I hope I can, I can at least write a proposal and then hope that uh, we will win it. Um, but yeah, many, many people in the community uh, don't have much, much more ideas than just yeah, doing the next classification and so far. And I think also Trimble itself is, uh, yeah, they, they want to sell the software, but they don't want to invest so much in, in new developments. Let's say it like this, as uh, any company does. So I hope this answers your question. <laughs> yeah, I found also the same. So they are selling on, on this software, but uh, who are there? I don't know, are Caroline and many other was there also, uh, in ZGS, everybody all are doing so great, but hope uh, it will come again. Thank you. Thanks, Kabir. Yeah, I, I know that you've been uh, you've mentioned using eCognition in the past, so that's uh, exciting to to hear you know directly from Peter as to 
as to the connection points and the the shifting of the field too. Uh, I think that's definitely in, in the context relevant for this group. Uh, I see Ate, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Peter, for this very interesting presentation. I wasn't really aware of this this methodology, so I learned a lot in the last uh, forty five minutes. Um, but but I was wondering, uh, this method seems to work very well for high resolution satellite imagery, but how is the performance on, let's say, Sentinel two, uh, Landsat, or maybe even Modis? Yeah, so um, uh, starting with Landsat, because here we have the most experience, um, the difference is not so, so much higher than two pixel-based approaches. And as I said, the reason is that in a 30 meter pixel, um, the most information is already in the spectral information. And for this, you don't need any geometric or texture or what else, further information that really helps you. Um, Sentinel is a little bit borderline. Um, the examples you saw, um, um, not the play arts, the other examples, they were a subset of from the Netherlands. This was uh, Sentinel 2. Um, with Sentinel-1, um, I have not much experience yet. Um, I said in the beginning, I think that uh, why OBIA is, is that um, also in the Millennium um, radar became more and more um, uh, yeah, interesting to the community, especially with Radarsat data, with this relatively high resolution. And um, yeah, so and um, we, we made a lot of um, experience also with radar data and found it quite well because um, it can, e cognition can, or well, general buyer can handle noisy data quite well. Um, with MODIS, I have honestly no experience with e cognition. I would guess um, there's not much difference um, between classic pixel based approaches and, and, and e cognition or, or buyer in general. But um, yeah. Uh, maybe a motivation for you to do some some little research and to publish them in uh, yeah journals, remote sensing journals. That <laughs> that sounds great. Then then for for the radar imagery, uh, what what specific classes can you map really well? Oh, um, forestry, of course. Um, yeah. Um, water bodies, of course. I mean th that's quite easy, but. Um, for both classes, usually you have this noise, and uh, with object-based approaches, um, yeah, you're simply uh, smoothing away this noise because you're always generating contiguous areas, and then you're analyzing um, the areas, uh, yeah, based on the on the, on the on the area statistics. And if you have some 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 radar background that you can better interpret interpret the result, uh, the, not the result, the the, the signals, and uh, the signal within an area then you can get quite good results. So there's, uh, I think there are still some examples on the eCondition homepage. Uh, I can remember we made some analysis uh, on mangrovey forests in Indonesia, somewhere in Southeast Asia, which were quite interesting, quite well. Um, I myself did some analysis on SRTM data a long time ago, which was rather about analyzing the quality of the data. Um, and I had really bad images, so to speak, because it was the worst case you can get with SRTM. It was from Gibraltar, and the shuttle was directly flying into the direction of the rock of Gibraltar, and you had many bounces, double bounces, and stuff like this. So everything, there were things you can imagine with radar data happened in this imagery. And so, yeah, I could uh, I could distinguish between noise and um, uh, yeah, more information-like areas, and uh, very easily was also the water detection. Uh, for the landscape analysis, pff, SRTM is certainly not the best. Um, and also radar data is, is a bit, little bit limiting. I mean, it depends on the application. If, you have, if you're working with um, um, on uh, humidity of, of your objects, uh, then radar is perfect. Um, also in the agriculture, uh, radar has some, some reason to use. Uh, in urban areas, it's a little bit difficult because of all these complicated uh, geometry of, of radar. Yeah, so you can use it with Obaya. Got it. That's awesome. That's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? 
I don't want to hog the mic, but you know, I you gave a really great list of pros and cons, and and I was sort of writing down notes during your presentation and thinking about you know the one advantage that we really have um, with our connections to Google and the TensorFlow uh, workflow that we're, we're using right now is this uh, opportunity to tap into the scale of different imagery that's available. And I wonder, um, just from your experience, Peter, of of uh, doing the Obaya work, um, what what are some of the hurdles with um, accessing scale data? Um, or are you are you mainly working, you know, in individual use cases? Um, and I'll just you know close up this comment with um, often all the folks on these calls are um, located at severe regions, so either in the Mekong or HKH or Amazonia. Uh, so they have you know regional focus on developing products, but also there's a there's a global focus too. Uh, for different land cover products, for instance. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's one area that we kind of tap into uh, of doing both regional and sort of global. Um, and I was hoping to get your perspective on that because um, it's just very, very interesting um, sort of assessing your pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I was once, I was working for, working for a year for the, for the private company called IABG. Um, they are located in, in Munich and in Dresden. And uh, my task there was to work and rework existing rule sets because they wanted to um, optimize their rule sets in order to doing a fully automated uh, analysis uh, of, of uh, what was it, rapid eye data and also Sentinel-2 data. So they continuously downloaded Sentinel data and tried to process them. And to a certain extent, it works quite well, especially for land use land cover. Um, in that uh, special case, it was, um, so you have this, this uh, data type catalog that was given from the German survey. And there are some classes which are not easy to detect at all in remote sensing data. And so also do the classification rules for them. Um, but if you think about something like, uh, what, what is it called, uh, the, the global land cover, for instance, uh, this is something that could be you know, automated quite easily, I think also with Obaya. Um, um, there's, for Corrine, I, I'm not sure if the software is used. Um, I think to some degree they use it. Um, I mean, meanwhile, they're just in an update stage, so there's not so much to process. It's, you know, usually it's in just in the beginning, if you start some, some, some land cover projects for a larger area, the beginning is, is uh, very intensive and then you're only doing updates usually and the updates are not so, so um, critical. Yeah, so um, I think with Obai, you can, you can also do something like on a global scale um, and you can also include it uh, in, a, in a processing chain where you say, okay, I'm, I'm continuously downloading data. This is, by the way, this is one plan here at ITC to do this um, with uh, landslides. So we have a PhD thesis, I think it's uh, going on at the moment, which tries to detect automatically uh, landslides uh, by different ways, including also Obaya. And uh, I can remember, because I gave a, a, a short uh, introduction to the software to this guy and after five minutes he was really impressed because the segmentation gave him already the landslides he needed <laughs> it was just pressing one button um, and the plan is to do this on a global level um, so that you can do in in i don't know in how many years but the plan is to have really in a, in a 24 7 service a continuous observation of the planet um, Assuming that there yeah, are no clouds and all these other hurdles uh, you can imagine, uh, that you can uh, analyze um, yeah, as many images as you can imagine continuously and um, then get an information about where is the next landslide and what has happened there. So it's possible it, it is in any way. Peter, thanks so much. Yeah, I know we're at the top of the hour, so I hate to cut this conversation short. Thank you so much. Um, and I will talk to everybody on this line in, uh, in two weeks. Thanks for having me.